coming up on this week's travel show. Is this the original costume? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're on the Bruce Lee Trail in Hong Kong. He wore this in Game of Death. Get ready to get behind this taxi. All right. Yeah? I get a lesson in how to take iconic Instagram images from an expert. Oh, that's good. <laughs> And with new laptop bans on some international flights, we have a look at the gadgets you can still take on board. better known as Bruce Lee, may have been born in San Francisco, but in the early 1970s, he put both Kung Fu and Hong Kong on the map. Everybody was Kung Fu fighting. After starring in a succession of cult martial arts movies, he became the most famous Asian film star in the world. And today, almost 45 years since his untimely death at the age of 32, he is still credited as being the man who brought Chinese actors and martial arts into the mainstream. And here in Hong Kong, they're rightly proud of their most famous son. Now, the film that really shot Bruce Lee into international stardom was Enter the Dragon in 1973, shot mainly on location here in Hong Kong. And if you're a fan of the film, you might recognize this place, Kenyon Lee. But if you're a real die-hard Bruce Lee fan, then you'll need to go to Hong Kong's Heritage Museum for a unique insight into his legendary life. Wow, yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, lung chops is one of our very significant symbol of blues. You can see he practiced this kind of weapons when he taught his students. And then you can see in his first TV program, the Green Hornet. And is this the original costume? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is also the iconic costume. You can see he wore this in the Game of, Game of Death. Yeah, and then nowadays you can still see many people to yeah. wear this costume as a symbol of blues. Yeah. Fellow martial arts film actor Victor Kan studied under the iconic Wing Chun master Yip Man, and he remembers the very first time he met Bruce Lee at a training session back in the mid 1950s. He can pick up the movement things very quick, and. Uh, because that time was also a social thing. You know, oh, Wing Chun, Wing Chun, we do Wing Chun and all that uh, for the teenage in the school. But I can say that he done the cha 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 better than Wing Chun that time. He was the champion. The dance? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. What do you think Bruce would think about this exhibition some 40 years after his death? Not big enough. <laughs> <laughs> Should be bigger. Yeah, obviously. You don't know how, how, Im how impressive he is still in the whole wide world. Inspired to learn some killer kung fu moves myself, I head to the Wan Chai district of Hong Kong, where I've got a date with a man who's passionate about studying and preserving Chinese martial arts. First, the warm up. This is horse dance, okay? Horse. Horse dance. Am I low enough? Yes, you are. <laughs> right. I don't know you if I can get up, up now. now. <laughs> and then this is called a zi ma. So, hold on, where Also called the bow stance. Horse stance, horse stance. This feels more like a workout than a warm-up. I'm not sure if I'll be able to walk tomorrow. Whew. Time to step things up a bit. If I punch you here, you block with this. Okay. Ah, right. okay. So 
So. Yeah, good. Right. Okay. <laughs> I'll give you a punch. Okay. Whoa. Okay. okay. That's it. Ah, okay. I get it now. I think I'm going to have a bruise on my Now prepare to enter the dragon. Once upon a time, there were hundreds of small martial arts studios like this all over Hong Kong. But that's not the case anymore. A lot of Kung Fu schools were actually run in a space like this, which unfortunately over the past 20, 30 years have become very unaffordable to the average teacher who simply cannot find enough um, students to justify the rent. So I think the first and foremost problem people face in Hong Kong when you talk about uh, continuing the practice of Kung Fu is lack of space. Yeah, this is the blue house. You can't see very much, unfortunately, because of all the building walls. If you're a real martial arts fan, though, there are still some places to see here in Hong Kong that Bruce Lee would have recognized and maybe even trained at. Over there, there's a plaque which says Lam Zhan Hien, uh, Gin San Yun. Lam Zhan Hien is the name of a Kung Fu master whose entire family lived here. Mm -hmm. Ping Chao organizes a Kung Fu festival here in Hong Kong to try and keep interest in martial arts alive and reclaiming some of the heritage he feels has been lost. So this place used to buzz with Kung Fu until I would say probably 1970s, 1980s. Wow. This was one of the really big hubs of uh, Kung Fu in Hong Kong. That's amazing. I can't imagine yeah. seeing people yeah. doing Kung Fu on the streets. Exactly. But that's, you know, what really breathed life into uh, Hong Kong community and that's why Kung Fu was so vibrant. But if you know where to look, you can still find authentic classes like this one, given by Master Lee Tin Loy, oh, taking place in some of the remaining training studios here. But it's not just a question of space and high rents that's threatening the survival of martial arts in Hong Kong. The new generation, they will everything speed. They don't have time, and they want to, they want to, uh, they want to learn the uh, kung fu any style in possible two weeks. Right. It is not possible, impossible thing, but they have no time. Recognizing that Hong Kong's Kung Fu heritage is under threat, a local university has now called on some of the surviving martial arts masters of Bruce Lee's generation to take part in a unique project, using modern motion capture technology to document and preserve the traditional moves that could one day be lost. Let's say 50 years from now or 100 years from now, there's suddenly a, a, a burst of new, you know, sort of interest in, in martial arts. These documents which we are creating now are going to be, you know, templates mm -hmm. for, for future generations to work with. And that, that's what we're really looking to the long-term future. Go. Go. There's no doubt that films like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon and the Ip Man trilogy have helped to rekindle an interest in martial arts. Whoa! It's like a concrete block, that is. Yeah. But it's hoped that the motion capture program here at the university will ensure that Kung Fu and the legend of Bruce Lee survives for generations to come, both here in Hong Kong and around the world. Well, if you're thinking of heading to Hong Kong anytime soon, here's some travel show tips to help you on your way. Although this year marks the 20th anniversary of the handover between Britain and China, travellers from many countries still don't need to apply for a visa to visit Hong Kong. As ever, check before you book to make sure you're from one of those visa waiver countries, but also remember that you will definitely need a visa if you plan to travel on to mainland China from Hong Kong. Chinese New Year is always a good time to visit, although you might need to book well in advance as hotels are busy. And remember that summers here can be hot and humid, so bear that in mind too. There's no shortage of cheap and effective ways to get around Hong Kong Island and neighboring Kowloon, but if you're looking for something a little more traditional, why not jump aboard one of these iconic trams, also known as Ding Dings? The trams operate on six routes every day between Kennedy Town and all of the main tourist attractions on Hong Kong Island. 
There you go. Ding, ding. And if you want to get away from the hustle and bustle, don't forget that Hong Kong is surrounded by dozens of smaller, less developed islands, so it's often just a short ferry ride away to some peace and quiet or an empty beach. Well, stay with us, because still to come here on The Travel Show... As new security measures stop you boarding some flights with laptops and tablets, Lucy's here with Clever Tech to take on board. What are the best apps to keep me entertained on a long-haul flight? Zoom in a little bit. Wait, not too much, not too much. Yep, there you go. And I get some tips on how to become an Instagram sensation here in Hong Kong. If you could do a street <laughs> shot with an amazing purple sky, that would do, just blow up. So don't go away. The Travel Show, your essential guide wherever you're heading. Laptops, tablets and e-readers are all now banned on many flights to the US and UK, primarily from airports in the Middle East. Both governments have brought in new rules affecting different countries, so check first if you're flying from any of these places. But there are still some gadgets you can use to while away the hours. This week, our rundown of the gadgets that you can still use on board. And here's the good news. On some flights, you should be allowed to take handheld games consoles. So I've been using our state-of-the-art isolation booth to see how they fare. So this is the new big player on the market. It's the Nintendo Switch. So the Switch isn't like regular consoles, though it combines portable on-the-go gaming with traditional console-style gaming. On the one hand, you connect it to your TV, but when you're ready to take it on the move, you can simply slide the Joy-Con controllers into the side. The graphics look really good. What I really like about this as well is that you can connect up to eight consoles. So let's say you're traveling with a load of friends, you can connect your consoles together for true multiplayer-style gaming. But I must warn you, games are pricey, so please bear that in mind if you're gonna pick one of these up. Ooh. I'd still be a bit careful though, so if you're on a UK-bound British Airways flight from the Middle East, you can take these devices on board, while Jet2 says you can't, so it's definitely worth checking with your airline before you fly. And if you're flying to the US, these devices are definitely off the table, and all you've got for entertainment will be your trusty mobile. So while you're in the air, don't think of this as a smartphone. This is your entertainment center, so it will pay to choose your apps carefully before you travel something James here is an expert in. So James, what are the best apps to keep me entertained on a long haul flight? So here's Pocket Cast. Uh, this gives you like featured content. So these are tailored by Pocket Cast to give you some of the best new podcasts that are around. There's also trending stuff. So if something's really popular at a time and people are getting really excited about it, that would appear right there at the top. Netflix. Everyone's heard of Netflix, mm -hmm. but they now do offline functionality. So you can download a whole TV series to your phone and you can watch it on the flight. And so for my last choice, I've gone with Lonely Planet City Guides. Mm -hmm. So it essentially gives you information for the, wherever you're going to be landing in. You get a whole city guide here that you can access offline. You don't need to oh, connect wow. to roaming data and you can get places to see, places to eat, and even hotel locations. It's all there ready and waiting for you. You've downloaded it all to your phone. No need to connect to the internet again. So, so what about battery life? It depends on what you're going to be using. If you're going to be using Netflix, that's going to take a lot of your battery. If you try to watch a full series on your phone, that's probably not going to work out. Uh, but for podcasts, your phone's going to be sat idle in your pocket and just playing audio, so it's not going to take that much of your battery. You may want to take a charging cable with you or something, because some flights do allow you to charge in the seat. Finally, if you're flying for a grown-up reason, maybe you're away on business, games and apps aren't going to cut it. So this is the Moleskine Smart Writing Set, which yes, does look like a bog-standard pen and notepad, but it's actually a lot smarter than that because it can transfer your writing, doodles and scribbles into digital form. It can even turn them into text, all via a dedicated application. So once you start writing, the app is able to register the strokes of the pen, and it knows that your handwriting and immediately shows you what you're writing on the app. Now, I must admit, you do have to press the pen quite hard in order for it to register, um, but it seems pretty quick, pretty automatic. I also can't draw. <laughs> it's fun, it's really easy to use, and I've got to admit, it is quite cool seeing your scribbles transferred into digital form, but the question I've got to ask is, what's wrong with a regular notepad and pen and then taking a picture afterwards?
Now, since it was first launched in 2010, Instagram has become one of the world's hottest places to upload and share travel photos. And here in Hong Kong, former Londoner Edward Barnier is one of the most liked and shared online photographers, capturing the hustle and bustle of the city through his camera lens. I went to meet him to pick up some tips. This isn't the usual place that most tourists would take photos in Hong Kong. No, no. Why this, are we is, here? Um, this is very different. These are the back streets of Hong Kong. It's very gritty. It's real life. The great thing about Hong Kong is that there's no back of house. So basically, whatever anyone's doing, they're doing it right in your face, alongside people getting on buses and coming home from school. But it's so dreary and it's raining. How uh, are we going to get good pictures? Dreary is good. It's really? Gonna be, yeah, you're going to get people walking with umbrellas. You're going to get people that are soaking wet with no umbrellas. <laughs> reflections of the lights as the lights come on at night. Reflections in puddles. Rain is perfect for photography. I've just got a smartphone. Is this OK for pictures? Yes, they're great. I started with a smartphone that was had much worse quality camera than that. And I was able to capture with good light a number of things. Yes, the focal length is fixed, but it makes you choose your composition wisely. But it's a great tool to learn on before you move on to a camera. Zoom in a little bit. Not too much, not too much. Yep, there you go, real life. <laughs> As Edward has over 175,000 Instagram followers, I'm in safe hands as we head off on our side street safari. But with so much going on around us, I'm having problems deciding what to focus on. It seems messy to me. Right? What, with the people? So see, I like it without the people. Right, sometimes the people can offer up um, a bit of scale as well. And so just having one person there sometimes gives the, that kind of um, perspective to someone of what they're actually looking at and the size of it. street signs, you got some colour, you captured it all there. Oh, thanks. Yeah, and the, actually you got most of that because your smartphone's got a wider focal length, so you were able to get more in, whereas I was like packed in quite tight. Because these look like two different locations, right? Yeah, I think a lot of mine to do, to do with my lens and the shutter speed I used made it darker, and also the depth of field gave it a bit more dramatic vibe, but generally I've, I've, I've got a much closer shot, and you're right, maybe it, it looks like it could be somewhere else altogether but um, I'm happy with some of the sparks that I got flying up there. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. Cool. It looks exciting. I would never think to take a picture of this, right? Well, there never. you go. <laughs> Stick it on Instagram, see what your friends think. You know, I have no idea where I am. Yeah. <laughs> I often think that's the beauty of it, though. I can tell you that we are very close to one of the major shopping districts in Hong Kong, with many tourists maybe 200 metres from us right now. Really? But um, you wouldn't know it. Maybe if you just look at that building there, that tall building, yeah. that building is actually a Langham place, and it's one of the major malls in Hong Kong. But because, as I said before, Hong Kong is so densely packed together, um, and that's the beauty of it. It means when you're going to look for photos, you don't really have to travel that far yeah. to get what you want. I like it, but it was more, you know, a quick shoot and run because yeah. I was scared the old lady yeah, was going to come a, out and lot, get me. A lot of these shots, you're going to have to just shoot once, and if you get it, you get it, and if not, you don't. But you're very lucky to capture something there with an iPhone because she is quite far off, so you've done really well there. So what works well on Instagram? Like, if I want to get maximum likes, well, what should I be taking pictures of? It's architecture, street shots. Also, not so much lately, but um, an amazing typhoon sunset as well. Something, if you could, in fact, if you could combine the two, if you could do a street <laughs> shot with an amazing purple sky, that would do, just blow up. That would be huge. As night falls, we're joined by fellow Instagrammers Jess and Vivian, who also both have big followings here in Hong Kong and around the world. So now, the pressure really is on as I face even more competition from the professionals. We're in Mong Kok, and we're here to see some of the neon lights on Portland Street, which is one of Hong Kong's most famous streets. And uh, at night, especially after it's rained, you can just see the streets glow. 
uh, as you can see here. It's pretty cool, right? Wow. With a smartphone, you just have to use what's around you. Sometimes at night, you can get like that really atmospheric and get a more gritty side. But you know what? Sometimes you just have to be bold and like really put That's a good tip. Just stand there and wait. Like, patience. patience is everything. I like that one. Yeah, that's nice. You've got the neon, the rays, action shot. Yeah. And he's smiling. <laughs> <laughs> No, just the smartphone's not very good in at night time. I'm feeling they're not, they won't be as good as yours, Edward. Because we'll, they we'll were see. in the day, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> so before I go, yeah. I want to get the iconic Hong Kong taxi. Yes, yes. Taxi Everybody shot knows whizzing taxi by shot. with neon signs. Yeah. How do I do that um, with a smartphone? Is with a smartphone, be... it's going to be tough to get that kind of uh, the long exposure that you're looking for. But um, I honestly think that we can do something slightly different, but I think you're really going to like it. We're going to try and get behind the taxi and capture the city with the taxi in the foreground. Okay. How does that sound? All right. Good. Let's give that a try. Let's do it. Get ready to get behind this taxi. All right. Yeah? Now get out there and go shoot, shoot behind the taxi. Oh, that's good. <laughs> good, good, good. Let me see it. Hold on. That's excellent. I prefer that one. You like that yeah, one? Yeah, 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 you've done it. You could crop that one. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. Yeah, well done. You're a Hong Kong photographer now. <laughs> now you're pushing it. <laughs> Well, if you want to see more of those pictures, you can check out our social media feeds. All the details should be on your screen now. But that's all we've got time for this week. Coming up next week... Krista heads to the South American surface paradise of Punta de Lobos in Chile in search of the perfect wave. I got whacked in the face with about ten waves in a row, so I've swallowed most of that water, I think. Join us for that if you can. But until next time, from me, Carmen Roberts, and the rest of the Travel Show team here in Hong Kong, it's goodbye.